I am thrilled today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Xavier Amador. And it's very interesting, you know, we have had some fantastic speakers uh, on this webinar and uh, ABIN, Arkansas Behavioral Health Integration Network. We see ourselves as uh, providing training and assistance and then being a convener, bringing people together. Um, so this is another fantastic uh, webinar that we're putting on. And um, I want the way that we found Dr. Amador was actually as a part of another training. Uh, I was involved in a REACH Institute uh, case conference call last summer. And one of the family docs in Texas presented a, a case about a patient that they had who was uh, probably in her mid to late 50s, 60s and had schizophrenia and needed medication. She was very distressed by her uh, uh, thoughts that someone uh, was breaking into her house every day. Uh, the family doc could not get the patient to take her medication and would not go to see a psychiatrist. So we were trying to help her figure out how to help this patient who also had diabetes and, and her uh, feeling paranoid and upset uh, was getting in the way of her taking care of herself. So we uh, found some resources online, just looking up how to help a subpatient who has schizophrenia and uh, came across Dr. Amador's book called, I'm not sick, I don't need help. So I downloaded it, began to read, then went to his website, the Leap Institute. And, um, and although at one point I thought, well, I really, even though I'm a psychiatrist, I'm not treating patients now. I thought, you know, I'm not really having to deal with uh, patients who have psychosis up to, you know, every day. But interestingly enough, over the past, uh, I would say six weeks, I've had three phone calls um, from people asking me to help them. Two were family members uh, who had a family member with a some sort of an illness that they seem to be acting out of feeling very paranoid and um, but they would not get help they would not take medication and another one was a similar situation as the first a family uh, primary care clinician who had a patient with schizophrenia who had quit stopped taking his medicine and stopped going to his clinic um, so even though I wasn't treating I was still having to um, struggle with how do you help someone who's sick but doesn't need um, who won't get help. And then the third way that, uh, that Dr. Amador's information has helped me is in our REACH Institute training for family physicians to help patients with uh, any mental illness or disorder in primary care. We train people using the LEAP technique. Um, and this is in some ways like motivational interviewing. So I actually have a sticky note on my computer right now that says, listen, engage, empathize, educate, agree, partner, and plan. So no matter what type of work you do or what type of um, uh, who you may be around, you're going to find something interesting in this presentation. Uh, so enough about me. Dr. Xavier Amador is an internationally renowned clinical psychologist, author, and leader in his field. His books, published clinical research, and worldwide speaking tours, and the extensive work in schizophrenia, bipolar, and other disorders have been translated into 30 languages. He's also the CEO of the Henry Amador Center on Anosognosia, and uh, a family caregiver of two close relatives with serious mental illness. So he's got professional and personal experience that inform what he'll be saying. He is now the visiting professor of psychology at State University of New York. And over the course of two decades, he was the professor of psychiatry and clinical psychology at Columbia University and director of psychology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. His expertise has been called upon by government, industry, and the broadcast and print media where he's appeared on uh, numerous CNN, ABC, NBC, NBC, Fox, a whole paragraph of media. Um, he is also the founder of the Leap Institute and uh, we, we can share the website. And uh, we are thrilled and appreciate you coming to speak to us today, Dr. Amador. And uh, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much. I'm glad we found each other. 
And it's nice to be uh, in Arkansas, even though um, I'm doing it virtually. Um, if my camera turns off, it's I'm not hiding from you. I've got camera problems. And if I'm looking over here, I'm not checking emails. I'm looking at your faces, at least those who have their, their cameras on. Uh, anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm going to be talking about uh, patients who often say there's nothing wrong with them. I'm not sick. Uh, they don't want any of the help that we're offering. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment where I first heard this phrase, I'm not sick. I don't need help. But the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about this morning is what's the nature of the problem? Why is it that so many patients with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, bipolar disorder, and those are the disorders I'm going to be focusing on, although it, what I'm going to talk about is relevant to others, but primarily on those, uh, those that schizophrenia spectrum, bipolar spectrum. Why do so many uh, believe there's nothing uh, amiss, there's nothing wrong, that they don't have a psychiatric disorder? So I'm going to be talking about that, and I'm going to introduce the LEAP method that you just heard about, uh, which is based in part on motivational interviewing, uh, Rogers client-centered therapy, and also cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But let me let me start where I started. And um, really the impact of poor insight on relationships and as well as clinical course. This is a picture of my brother, Henry. Uh, our nonprofit is named after Henry Amador. Uh, and he's looking in the window. I'm the little guy driving the car. And this picture was taken in, in Cincinnati, Ohio at the, uh, I was going to say the turn of the century. No, in the 1960s, in the early 1960s. And we were refugees from Cuba. We landed in Ohio. Our father had been killed in the revolution. Uh, my mother was, was uh, really distraught and, and suffering from depression. And without a father and with a mother who was having very serious mental health issues, my brother became much more than a brother. Uh, he, he looked out for me. He was my best friend. He was a father figure uh, in many respects. So I want you to fast forward from this picture of these two brothers. Uh, and what I just told you about Henry, uh, what a what a loving and uh, supportive brother he was. And fast forward in your mind's eye, about 20 years later, I'm in New York studying psychology. Henry had sort of slowly slid into uh, isolation, uh, uh, really a lot of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. We didn't know it at the time. He was living with my mother and my stepfather in Arizona. So I, I think someone has their mic on, a telephone number there. Um, it's okay for me, but not, not great. <laughs> if I could, thank you for muting that. Um, anyway, I was in New York. He was in Arizona. I get a phone call from Henry, and he says, come home quick. I killed dad, referring to our stepfather. He hung up. I thought there's no way that, that Henry killed anyone, much less our, our stepfather who we loved. Got him back on the phone eventually. It took about an hour. And he proceeded to tell me, uh, describe really delusions that he had been playing the guitar while our father was out uh, jogging and the music had been transmitted into his head and caused him to trip and fall. Well, that's not how he died. He died from a, from a heart attack. And um, I flew home to Arizona and my siblings, uh, you know, pointed at me and, and it kind of elected me <laughs> To, uh, to quote, deal with Henry. Um, uh, so I went and I talked to my brother and I said, there's something really wrong. He was hearing voices. He had other delusions uh, that our mother was the devil incarnate, that she really was literally the devil um, and that he had killed our father. So I'm trying to explain to him, you've got a problem. Let's go see a psychiatrist. Let's go to the emergency room. He wanted nothing to do with it. He said, I'm not sick. I don't need help. He said, you're the crazy one, not me. I wonder how many of you have had that accusation from, from patients or if you're a family member like myself from your loved one. Took me a week to get him in the hospital and I bet most of you can guess how I got him in the hospital. I had to call the police. So they came, it actually went really well. This was back in 1981 before we had crisis intervention team trained uh, police officers, but it went really well. These officers were, were compassionate and understood mental illness. My brother goes to the hospital, gets well. I remember uh, hearing about the medication he was on, haloperidol, and going to the medical school library and looking it up and thinking, this is a miracle drug. He wasn't hearing voices. The delusions were largely gone. And um, it, you know, it, it seemed to really work well for him. So he was there a month 
if you can believe it, we had month long hospitalizations back in the early eighties. And um, he got better, as I said, and we're at a discharge meeting and it's explained to him, he's educated about his schizophrenia. He's educated about the medication. He's told he'll have to stay on it for the rest of his life if he wants to you know, function. And my brother says, okay, okay, he nods, I understand. We get home, we have dinner, I'm doing the dishes and I throw some garbage in the, uh, in the trash bin under the sink and what do you think I find? His bottle of what I considered to be a, a miracle drug at the time. I was young. And uh, I took the bottle out of the trash and I knocked on his door and I said, hey, what's going on? I was sort of brandishing this little pill bottle. And he said, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't, I don't need medication. And I said, well, just a few hours ago, you said that you understood that you had schizophrenia and you take the medication. He said, well, that was then, this is now. That started a uh, seven year period where our relationship looked like this, Henry running away from me, running away from psychiatrists, nurses, social workers, psychologists, running away from police at times, uh, about four hospitalizations a year for seven years, nearly 30 hospitalizations, many of them involuntary, no work, no friendships, no girlfriend. Uh, his, his life really had dramatically changed from what it had been like before. During the same time, I was being trained to be actually a psychologist. And I had a patient just like my brother. And I was getting nowhere with her. She was, uh, it was an acute inpatient psychiatric treatment. And uh, I tried to convince her and to educate her. And I was being met by what I then called resistance. Today, I call it something else, um, but a lot of resistance. And I went and I talked to my supervisor about it. And as I'm telling him about my conversation with this patient, he says, he says, hold on, stop, just stop talking. So I, I stopped talking. He says, no, what I mean is stop talking to her. You're talking at her, start listening. What are her goals? What does she want? So this is pretty fundamental stuff, right? But I went back out and I, and I said, you know, I, I apologize for not listening to her. Tell me what you want. And she had two goals, get out of the hospital and, and convince her mother to stop calling the crisis team on her. So we worked on those goals and it went really well. She accepted treatment. She worked with me in the uh, outpatient clinic. Uh, her mother ended up coming to family meetings. We, we you know, came up with a protocol where she wouldn't call the police on or the crisis team on her daughter um, if her daughter did certain things. So long story short is I had an epiphany that the way I'd been dealing with my brother was um, confrontation, trying to educate him. And, and thinking he was being stubborn, he was being difficult, he was being immature and, and irresponsible. Uh, he thought I was being a bully. Yeah, uh, and, and frankly, that's, that's the nature of our relationship that this picture depicts. So I apologized to Henry. I said, I'm really sorry for all the times I told you you were mentally ill. I'm sorry for all the times I told you you needed to take psychiatric medication. And I promise I'll never do it again. And then we started talking about what he wanted and what he needed. I kept that promise, by the way. I never told my brother he had schizophrenia again from 1981 till the day he died. I never told him he needed to take psychiatric medication. But within six months of that conversation with you know, a renewed relationship that looked like this, that's me on the left with the Jerry Seinfeld haircut, that's Henry on the right. Uh, and look how we're holding each other and smiling at each other. Not only did our relationship get renewed, but he accepted treatment. And for the rest of his life, uh, and he, he didn't die from his illness, uh, the rest of his life, he accepted a long-acting injectable medication. Never, this is really important, and I'm going to talk about some research in just a moment. He never understood, he never believed he had a mental illness of any kind. And yet he took an antipsychotic medication for nearly 20 years, for the rest of his life. So I wanna talk about the nature of the problem he had and the nature of the solution that I, that I stumbled upon uh, working with that patient. But first, let's just take a moment to talk about how mental illness is, is covered in the media. You know, stories of crimes get a lot of attention and, and very few stories of recovery. This is a, a story I'd like to highlight. This is Margaret Mary Ray, and I'm betting none of you know who, who that is, but I'm also betting that many of you know uh, know of her as David Letterman's stalker. 
when uh, David Letterman was still on the air, the late night uh, talk show host, uh, Margaret Mary Ray would break into his house in Greenwich, Connecticut, and a uh, very affluent area. And he'd come home from the studio from New York City, and she'd be there on the couch watching TV. He'd go to the phone and call 911. Uh, she got arrested. She got time in jail. She never uh, uh, ended up in treatment because she did not understand she had mental illness. Now, she ultimately died from her illness, not, not like my brother. And when I, when I talk about someone dying from their illness, I'm typically talking about suicide. And I'd invite you to think about how you talk about suicide uh, in the context of, of persons with serious mental illness, you know, brain disorders. Uh, the decision to end your life through suicide is not a knowing and voluntary decision. It's a consequence of brain dysfunction. So I prefer to say, um, it's an odd phrase to use, but I prefer the phrase, uh, a person dies from suicide. Mortality rate by suicide is about 10%. One out of 10 patients with schizophrenia, schizoaffective or bipolar disorder end up dying from suicide. So we're dealing with very um, high mortality rates among the biggest predictors, not being in treatment. Denial of illness, it's in quotes for a reason. Would you agree with me? Denial impairs the patient's common sense judgment about the need for treatment and services. Would you agree? Just raise your hand, uh, virtual hand or your real hand if you agree with that. Okay, I'm seeing hands go up. Not seeing any virtual, I'm seeing some virtual hands. Great, thank you. Um, I disagree. <laughs> if I take Henry's, my brother Henry's perspective, if I take the perspective of Margaret Mary Ray, whose story I just shared with you, or roughly 6 million Americans with serious mental illness who do not believe they have a mental illness. If I take their perspective, it's common sense to refuse treatment. It's common sense. Let me bring this point home. How many of you, raise your hand, would inject yourselves with insulin knowing for certain you do not have diabetes? Let's see if I see any hands go up. Inject yourself with insulin knowing you do not have diabetes. Not seeing any hands go up, right? Why wouldn't you? Because it could hurt you. It could even kill you. Uh, and I've certainly heard this from many patients with serious mental illness. The, uh, the medication you're trying to give me is, is causing symptoms. I'm not talking about side effects, by the way, uh, is poison, et cetera. But are we dealing with denial? Uh, what we're typically dealing with, and I'm going to review the research real, real soon, is anisognosia. It's a tongue twister, and I'm sorry for that. Um, it's, I didn't come up with the phrase. It was coined by the Hungarian neurologist working in France with Charcot, for those of you who know about psychoanalysis history. And Babinski, his name, uh, well, you probably know the Babinski reflex in, in newborns, same neurologist. He described patients with paralysis, for example, hemiparesis following stroke, uh, one side of their body paralyzed who did not know they were paralyzed. I've, I've actually evaluated patients in a neurology ward I worked on for a year with anisognosia for their neurological deficits. Uh, it's a very profound unawareness of illness. If you wanna pronounce it, this is a little trick I used uh, rather than the phonetic spelling, which always confuses me, anosognosia, anosognosia. And I would, I'd in, encourage you to uh, learn how to pronounce this. If you come away from this uh, seminar today, this morning, uh, believing that what we're encountering is anastignosia when patients say, I'm not sick, I don't need help. Uh, if you believe that, then it's very useful to be able to talk about this. So let me talk about neurological patients for just a moment. This is coming from a study, what I'm going to show you, that I did with colleagues at uh, Hillside Hospital in, in Queens, New York. And we had patients with frontal lobe damage and then posterior left and right hemisphere damage. And what we found, you know, one of the questions was, do you see anisognosia in the frontal lobes in le with lesions in the frontal lobes? Be because we know we see it in the non-dominant hemispheres, parietal lobes. Well, it turns out we do see it in the frontal lobes as well. And we're not the only um, investigators to report that. But let me give you a feel for how profound this unawareness is. This is a standard um, part of a neuropsychological test battery. You ask the patient to draw the clock and to indicate the correct time. Now, as part of our study, we asked 
the, the patients to rate how likely the, the copy would be good. Scale of one to seven, seven is an excellent copy, one is a terrible copy. This particular patient I'm gonna show you said seven, I'll have no problem doing this, no problem at all. This is the clock he drew. Lesions in the frontal lobe, construction apraxia, he had a neuro, neurocognitive neurological deficit and he didn't know it because I asked him, how did you do on a scale of one to seven? He said seven, perfect copy. So I started pointing to the 12s and you can, you can look at them yourself, the, the 12 inside the circle and then the, the four 12s outside the circle. And I asked him, you know, are there numbers outside the circle of a clock? So you, you'd think I've educated him, right? He now understands he's got a, a neurological you know, symptom, a deficit. Instead of learning, and realizing he had a problem, he pushed the paper away in a very paranoid, um, uh, angry tone, said, that's not my drawing, you've switched it on me. So he didn't learn and instead he became paranoid and thought that I had uh, switched, switched the drawing on him. This is a confabulation. What are confabulations? Basically our, our brain is making up stories to fill in gaps in, in memory and perception. So in this man, uh, he, he knows he can draw a simple clock. He knows that for certain. So if the clock is, is as you know, disorganized as what I showed you, and he sees that, he's shown that, uh, he confabulates. I must have switched it on him. And it's a paranoid confabulation. So let me just briefly touch on some research. And then we're gonna do a role play, by the way, uh, just to, just to uh, invite you to think about uh, volunteering. Um, research on anastagnosia and, and these illnesses I'm talking about. Uh, 30 years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, but 30 years ago, my colleagues and I uh, at Columbia University at the time uh, did a really uh, comprehensive review of the literature and, and on poor insight or denial in schizophrenia. And we hypothesized um, that those schizophrenia patients with executive dysfunction, frontal lobe dysfunction, would be patients who have poor insight. Uh, that's the term that's typically used in the literature. And th this is just a partial list of studies. Um, uh, and the, the last one is actually a, a review of about uh, 60 studies, all finding moderate to strong correlations between frontal lobe dysfunction and I'm not sick, nothing wrong with me. I don't need what you're offering. Uh, lack of insight, uh, poor insight. Uh, at that time, prior to these studies, actually, in the early 1990s, there was just a, a rush to judgment in our field that when patients say that there's nothing wrong with them who've been diagnosed with illness, that they're in denial, right? That it's, it's poor insight. Well, this, these studies of how the brain is functioning, uh, predicting uh, who does not understand their ill was, you know, pretty strong evidence that maybe what we're dealing with isn't denial. But what about the way the brain looks? This is 20 studies that compared the brains of people with schizophrenia who had insight, I'll use that term for now, compared them to the brains of, of patients who did not have insight. All the studies found significant differences in how the brains looked between aware and unaware subjects. In one or more brain structures, the majority of the brain structures involved are uh, those involved in executive function, frontal lobes of the brain, but also the, the uh, auditory verbal uh, regions of the brain, but primarily executive dysfunction, frontal lobe dysfunction. So it's not just the way the brain is working, the neuropsychological test studies that I showed you. It's also the way the brain looks, reduced gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, for example, is one of the findings. Now, some people said, well, this is because of antipsychotic medications. It's causing these brain differences. And there's no evidence that antipsychotics cause uh, you know, brain damage is really what, what the uh, detractors are saying. But with three that enhanced these, federal match. Three of these studies included uh, patients who had never been treated with antipsychotic medication. So, and, and by the way, three of those studies, of those three, one of them involved first episode patients. And this is important. First episode patients show brain dysfunction and even structural abnormalities um, in patients who don't understand their ill. So even first episode patients. One last study, uh, real quickly, uh, when the DSM was being revised, I was co-chair with Dr. Michael Flaum 
of the revision, and we did a, a large field trial study. I'm just gonna show you the schizophrenia patients. Over 500 patients were studied around the country and, and two international sites. We found that about 60% of patients with schizophrenia and schizoaffective and bipolar disorder did not believe they had a mental illness. They'd been diagnosed with it. They'd been educated about it. They nevertheless did not believe. This finding has been repeated now several hundred times in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. It's a big problem. It is the most common symptom in these disorders. Uh, in schizophrenia and schizoaffective and bipolar disorder, the mood symptoms are more common. But unawareness of illness is very common. Also unawareness of symptoms. We looked at this in the study I just described, and we found that there was unawareness of all kinds of symptoms uh, that the patient had. So we, we you know, evaluate a patient with a thought disorder and ask them if they had difficulty communicating uh, and did people understand them. And patients with severe thought disorder, about 50% said, no, I've got no problems whatsoever. So the way we understand this, my colleagues and I, is that it's, it's essentially a, a knowledge of self, self schema that is stranded in the time before the person became ill. So that today, you know, since uh, receiving a diagnosis of serious mental illness, the ones I'm talking about, uh, the person still thinks they have all the abilities and capacities that they had prior to the onset of illness. So I mentioned that I was co-chair with Dr. Michael Flom of the DSM-4 revision. Um, I'm mentioning this because the text was revised in a very particular way. In the history of the DSM, starting with DSM-1, I, I teach this to psychiatric residents actually in, in uh, University of Utah, where I also have an appointment. And um, uh, it was really interesting for me to go all the way back to DSM-1 and DSM-2. But this was three to four. TR means the text was revised looking at um, uh, the scientific literature and doing a peer review process. So we were essentially journal editors. And what did this group of experts who reviewed the literature uh, uh, obtain consensus about the following language. A majority of individuals with schizophrenia have poor insight regarding the fact that they're ill. Evidence suggests that poor insight is a manifestation of the illness, not a coping strategy. So it's a symptom, not denial. It may be comparable to the lack of awareness of neurological deficits seen in stroke termed anosognosia. So this may surprise a lot of you, but 22 years ago in the DSM, this was published in 2000, uh, experts in the field were already talking about, and this is not just me and, and Dr. Flom, these were you know, peer reviewed, uh, uh, basically an editorial board, uh, were noting that this looks a lot like, uh, like anosognosia, what we're seeing in schizophrenia patients. This symptom, it's been called a symptom for two decades now, um, in our authoritative manual on psychiatric diagnosis, this symptom predisposes the individual to non-compliance with treatment. It also predicts higher relapse rates, increased number of involuntary hospitalizations, big surprise, just like my brother, he didn't wanna to go to the hospital, nothing's wrong with him. I had to do an involuntary hospitalization. This symptom uh, of poor insight or anosognosia also predicts poor psychosocial functioning and a poor course of illness. No surprises here. If you don't believe you're ill, you're not gonna take a pill, you're not gonna take a shot. Unless, unless you encounter someone who's going to work with you on your goals and in a very particular way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna review. What about today? That's, that's history, right? Uh, although I still have a DSM-4 TR on my desk because it's about a $200 book. <laughs> uh, and also it's the only peer reviewed uh, text. Uh, the actual DSM, didn't know I was going to use this prompt, uh, the diagnostic criteria is about this much in the DSM, all the diagnostic criteria. What's all this? This is information on uh, sex differences, differences in age of onset, associated features, and here to the DSM-5 TR. Now, the text was revised not using the same peer review process that, that we used uh, 22 years ago. But it still was revised to, to um, try and capture what the current research is, is indicating. So today, our 
authoritative diagnostic manual, says unawareness of illness, not poor insight. The neutral term is unawareness of illness. And by neutral, I mean, when you say poor insight, you're inferring that it's denial. So unawareness of illness is typically a symptom of schizophrenia itself, typically a symptom, majority of patients. It's a symptom of the illness, not denial. It's not a coping strategy. It is comparable to the lack of awareness of neurological deficits, deficits following all kinds of brain damage, not just stroke. And the term is anisognosia. Um, hopefully you said that out loud so you can practice if you, did, if you don't know how to say it. Uh, this symptom includes unawareness of, of the si other signs and symptoms like hallucinations, thought disorder, flat affect. So it includes unawareness of symptoms and may be, may be present through the entire course of schizophrenia. Anisognosia is also common in schizoaffective disorder and there's other research on bipolar disorder, finding it very, very common. This symptom is the most common predictor of non-adherence to treatment, the most common predictor. Let me get my camera back on. Uh, and it predicts all the other things that the DSM-4 talked about. Uh, higher relapse rates, big surprise. If you don't think you're ill, why would you take medication? Uh, increased number of involuntary treatments, poor psychosocial functioning. And there's one new uh, domain that uh, the symptom of anastignosia predicts, which is aggression, which is not too surprising. My brother, when we were struggling for those seven years, uh, where I was trying to educate him and from his perspective, I was bullying him, uh, he would get really angry. And frankly, I got really angry as a, uh, as a family member, as a loved one. Uh, I was very frustrated with them, and, and that sometimes uh, devolved into being angry. So let's take a moment, since we were just talking about anisognosia being the top predictor of uh, non-adherence to treatment, let's talk about the problem with oral antipsychotic medications. People either refuse them, like my brother, or they stop taking them without telling anyone. So in an inpatient unit, for example, somebody will cheat the meds. Once they're outpatient, my brother didn't tell anybody he was stopping medication. He just stopped it. He threw it in the garbage. Uh, that's a very, very common story that I'm sure many of you uh, have experienced firsthand uh, when patients relapse. What's the research show? This is one of many studies. Between 50 and 75% of patients with schizophrenia don't take medication at all, or they just take partial, some of the medication, subtherapeutic doses. This longitudinal study also by, um, uh, rather by Sam Keith and John King, found that within seven to 10 days of starting antipsychotic medication with, with patients in, in this study sample, 25% were off within just a week, a week and a half, 25%. 50% were off after only a year and 75% were off after two years. So non-adherence, non-engagement in treatment is a huge problem in schizophrenia. We see the same rates in schizoaffective and bipolar disorder. Uh, in the interest of, of time and getting to the, the main teaching points I'd like to get to, I'm not showing you all that data on schizoaffective and bipolar disorder. I'm asking you to take my word for it for now. So what treatment should we offer since oral antipsychotic medications have such an abysmal uh, adherence rate? Well. There's research on that. Long-acting uh, uh, injectable treatments uh, are superior when it comes to adherence. This is one study, uh, again, by Sam Keith and John Kane. They found, like everybody finds, about half of patients in the study uh, stopped taking medication compared to only 17% on long-acting injections. So let's flip those numbers around. 50%, only 50% who are taking oral medications stayed on their oral medications whereas 83% on the long-acting injectables stayed on the medication. Um, now, why is that? This common sense, if the person is taking oral medication and they don't understand they're ill, every time they've got those capsules or pills in their hand and they move them to their mouth, they have to fight the resistance that they naturally understandably feel. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need this medication. And so eventually, doses are going to be missed. Eventually, the person is going to, uh, in, in many instances, throw the medication away. 
uh, because every day, sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day, they have to fight. Um, well, I asked you if you'd inject yourself with insulin, right? Uh, that's what it's like for somebody who has anosognosia for mental illness. Uh, I don't need this. It could hurt me. You know, I really don't need this. So that has to be fought every day versus long acting injectable treatments once every two weeks, once a month. There's a formulation that comes once every three months. And, and in the pipeline is a once a year injection. And intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. When someone misses an appoint, appointment for an injection, it's a smoke detector. If the person misses an appointment, we, we can hear about it, especially if we're the provider. And we can then uh, use our relationship to engage the person in, in making a, a new appointment and getting their medic getting the medication. It's not their medication from their perspective. Uh, it's, it's the medication, it's my medication, frankly, that I'm trying to offer them. Um, it also reduces tension, long acting injectables. Um, if you're asking patients uh, on an outpatient uh, basis, uh, so how's it going the medication? Have you been taking it? I'm putting the person with anosognosia for their mental illness in a very difficult position because if they've stopped taking the medication, they have to lie to me. They often will lie to me, understandably. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's a nefarious lie. I think it's a white lie. Like, yes, I am taking the medication. And just the act of having to ask the question creates tension. With long acting injectables, you know the person's on the, in, in treatment. You know it already. You don't even have to ask. You can ask about side effects, of course, but you don't have to ask, is the person taking the medication? So it reduces tension. And as I said a moment ago, when the person misses uh, an appointment for the injection of the medication, you can use uh, your relationship and uh, uh, interventions like the LEAP approach, which I'm gonna introduce you to, uh, to discuss the person's reluctance to keep, keep an appointment. And, uh, and we have data on that when using LEAP, uh, you actually can uh, pretty reliably increase the likelihood that the person will make a new appointment. So aware, awareness of illness and treatment adherence, while well, awareness of, of being ill, typically called insight, is among the top two predictors of long-term medication adherence. You, you got that from the DSM. What do you think the second top predictor is? Most people say experience of side effects. It turns out that neg negative experiences with side effects do not predict who will refuse treatment, which surprised me when I, when I reviewed the literature and saw that because my patients complain to me about side effects and tell me that's why they don't wanna take the medication. I think actually what is going on in that instance oftentimes is that my patients are telling me what they know I'm willing to listen to. I'm not willing, well, I am today, but I didn't used to be willing to listen to the, the person say, there's nothing wrong with me, I don't need your help, right? So instead they'll talk to me about something that I'm talking about, which are the side effects. It turns out the other top predictor uh, comes from research on the therapeutic alliance. And it's a particular alliance it's a relationship with someone who listens to you without judgment. So when my patient says to me, I'm not mentally ill, I don't need this treatment you're offering me, I don't try to educate them, I reflectively listen. So what you're telling me is you're not ill. You don't, you don't need treatment, right? Did I get that right? I check in with the person to see if they felt heard. Uh, I don't assume that I've heard them, I ask them. Um, and I respect their point of view. Again, that would entail not trying to educate the person and convince them they're wrong. So non-judgmental, respectful communication. Somebody talks about the alien transmitter in their brain. Well, tell me more about that. Rather than uh, suggest that maybe this is in their mind, this is, you know, this is not true. And the person that is non-judgmentally listening and, and respectfully communicating would like to see you try treatment. Notice the phrasing. The phrasing isn't, uh, uh, is telling you that you need treatment. It's that they'd like you to try treatment, to give it a chance. Um, and what for? Well, all kinds of things like sleep, anxiety. These are things that are non-controversial uh, for patients with anosognosia. So let me summarize. What do we know about anosognosia uh, for illness and acceptance of treatment? We don't win on the strength of our argument. 
are attempts to educate the person that they're mentally ill. We do win on the strength of our relationship, a non-judgmental, respectful relationship. And that means even the irrational and delusional beliefs, even the anisognosia beliefs, we respect that we don't judge it. So summarizing, anisognosia, what's typically called poor insight uh, into having a serious mental illness is typically a neurocognitive symptom of these disorders. It is not denial. It tends to be stable over time. I didn't review that research, but it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, even when successfully treated, like my brother, the symptom of anisognosia tends to persist over time, just like some of the negative symptoms in schizophrenia. So my brother never believed he had mental illness, but he stayed in treatment. So the, the key here isn't convincing the person they have mental illness. The key to unlocking engagement and treatment is building, building this respectful, non-judgmental relationship where you also do have an opinion, you like the person to try treatment. Top predictor of treatment refusal and dropouts. Predictive of higher number of, of hospitalizations and other negative outcomes. Uh, this is what I reviewed in the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 TRs. And it's a common barrier to creating a working alliance, right? I used to call uh, my patients with, with poor insight or what I used to think was denial, um, and today I know is anastignosia. I used to call them the difficult patient, <laughs> the difficult patient. Today, I understand that person as being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they, they, they know they're not ill. Their family and everyone around them, even police officers sometimes, doctors, et cetera, are telling them they're sick, they're ill, they need help. And they know with certainty they're not. Uh, so that's gonna create a big barrier to creating an alliance. So when talking, when talking about anisognosia, how we talk about it really matters because it reflects how we think about it. So I would encourage you not to say that uh, she does not accept she has mental illness, as if it's a choice, right? Uh, refuses to acknowledge, um, uh, as if it's a purposeful, intentional act of stubbornness, right? Denies he has mental illness, doesn't admit she has mental illness, as if she knows, and it's like admitting to a crime. Um, it's not about someone not admitting to having a mental illness or won't admit. Uh, I was giving a talk and uh, uh, reviewing much of the same information I, I just shared with you. And uh, this was in Florida, for some reason, I remember that. And a woman gets up and she's brandishing my book. And she says, this book is great. It got me my relationship with my brother. You know, I was doing Q&A. Um, uh, it got me my relationship with my son back. Actually, she was talking about her son. And then she slaps it into her other hand and she says, but it doesn't work. And everybody laughs. And I said, okay, what, what are you talking about? And she said, he refuses to admit he has a mental illness. And everybody in the room started to laugh. And I said, well, let's, you know, let's not laugh at her. Let's, you know, why are you laughing? Let's explain it. And as a group, they, as a, like a chorus, they all said, anisognosia. So even though she had read about it, even though she had learned how to use LEAP, she really didn't understand yet uh, because of the way she was talking about it, that this is a deficit. This is a symptom. It's not her son refusing to admit something he knows. So how do we talk about it? Cannot comprehend. She has an illness. He's unaware. He has mental illness. Unable to see or understand. So unaware, can't comprehend, unable to see or understand. These, this language reflects the nature of the symptom of anisognosia. And ideally you'd be saying has anisognosia for mental illness. I do a lot of consultations with families and, uh, and we do a consultation intake form and we ask for medical records. And I just saw recently uh, a, a young man diagnosed with sch schizophrenia with anisognosia. It's not technically a subtype yet. We're, we're actually at our nonprofit working on that with the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases. Uh, making it a subtype there will trickle down to the DSM. But it's not a subtype, but this psychiatrist who was familiar with the research in anisognosia decided to diagnose the symptom, which is a legitimate thing to do. So I've been talking a lot about uh, the research, what's in our DSMs, et cetera. 
I need a volunteer uh, so that you have a sense of what this feels like. And it, to be a volunteer, I'd like you to have a camera and be able to turn it on if it's not on and be married and working. So you have a job actively right now, you're not retired uh, or unemployed. Uh, and there's, a re there's reasons for that that'll become apparent. Uh, and you are married. Um, who would like to help me out for just a few minutes? I can do it. Okay. Do you know this role play, Patty? I have actually, yeah, I've seen it. So okay. Not to. Well, can do you think you can answer honestly what you would do? Not um, not not play someone you're not. No, I, I don't think I can. I know it. Okay, I see somebody else. Sarah? All right, Sarah. Sarah. Fantastic. How are you doing today, Sarah? Can I call you Sarah? Is that okay? Of course. Okay, great. Uh, what's the name of your spouse? Aaron. Aaron, okay. And who's your supervisor at work? Uh, Jennifer Barton. Okay. I actually knew all this. Um, and this is really awkward. Can I, I can call you Sarah, right? I already asked you that. Sure, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is awkward. Uh, this is not the leap approach. Uh, I was, I was asked by, by Jennifer, uh, and frankly, by Aaron and Aaron's spouse, Aaron's real spouse to intervene with you. They, they all knew that you were going to attend this seminar and they knew the topic of the seminar and my experience with helping people with mental illness who don't understand they're ill. Um, Jennifer's put you on a medical leave of absence because the problem is you've been stalking Aaron. You have restraining orders and, and Aaron and Aaron's spouse uh, uh, are really upset, but they're also being very kind because they have a mentally ill loved one. And so they're trying to go easy on you. They don't want to keep calling the police on you. I mean, I have restraining orders. We could email over and I show, show them to you. Would that convince you that Aaron wasn't your spouse? No. Okay. Well, are you at work right now? Yes. Yeah, you're going to have to leave. Jennifer's going to going to come by in a few moments and and escort you out. And the good news, and maybe you won't think it's good news, is she has arranged for a, a mobile crisis team to meet you out front. Would you be willing to go? No. No. Jennifer pleads with you to go. Even after she pleads, you're not going to get up and go? This is your supervisor. No, I, I don't believe you. Okay. So she calls the police because you're on a medical leave of absence. You're, you're not an employee currently. You're not an active employee. And she apologizes profusely to you. And Sarah, I wish you didn't make me do this. But she calls the police. They come into your office and they tell you, two police officers, you know, please come with us. Do you resist or do you go willingly? Well, I might go. I don't okay. want confrontation. All right, very good. So you go with the police officers. They take you to court uh, because you've, you've been, oh, no, I'm sorry, they haven't. You haven't done anything wrong yet. What am I saying? So you're outside, the police escort you outside and they say, ma'am, uh, you're off the premises. You're not criminally trespassing. We're not going to file any charges. Uh, you're free to go. We strongly encourage you not to go back into the facility. Where do you go? After that, you go home? All right. Your key doesn't work. Aaron calls the police. The police pick you up. Turns out it's the same officers because they work with the mobile crisis team. And they take you into custody. Do you resist being taken into custody? Yes. Okay. So you're, right. so you're resisting arrest. You're in front of a judge. Now I'm the judge. Ms. Wat Ms. Watkins, right? Sorry to see you in my court today. I have in front of me a number of restraining orders. You violated another one by, by showing up at, at uh, Aaron's house. This is a, a person who you believe to be your spouse. Um, uh, you've also uh, criminally trespassed, violated restraining orders, I just said, and you resisted arrest. So I've got three charges. 
we can go to trial. Or because this is a mental health diversion court, you can go get treatment. We have a pre-trial intervention program, social workers in the back of the courtroom, go get treatment. And in six months, if you stay in treatment and the reports I get from your doctor are positive, you can expunge these charges. What do you want to do? Go to trial or go to treatment? Well, I don't believe you, but I would definitely go to treatment because that sounds easier and better for me. Okay. Ma'am, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that. This case is adjourned for six months. I wish you the best of luck. That's what the judge tells you. You go to the back of the courtroom, a social worker meets you, get into a van, and she drives you to the, to the hospital, the psychiatric emergency room. You get evaluated. The psychiatrist says, I'd like to offer you uh, admission to our, our psychiatric unit upstairs. Now, you're not a danger to yourself or others. You're not talking about harming anyone or suicide. Would you like to go? I can't keep you against your will, but I'd encourage you to go upstairs and admit, get admitted to the psych ward. What do you want to do, ma'am? Do I have to? Nope. I just explained you do not. You're not a danger to self or others. Oh, I don't want to be in there. Okay, well, I wish you the best of luck. We're going to sign you out AMA. That means against medical advice. And if you change your mind, we've got a bed and, and we would very much like to admit you and help you. So you go out of the emergency room, you're on the sidewalk. What do you do? Try to call my husband because everyone is crazy. Okay, so you call Aaron. Do you tell Aaron where you are? He calls the police. Why? Because you violated the restraining order by calling him. You're back in front of the judge. You get the same choices. This goes on for an entire year. You can't see Aaron. Every time you communicate with Aaron, even a text, you get caught up in the criminal justice system. You're offered treatment. You're offered diversion. Uh, maybe you decide to go on trial, I don't know, and, and get probation, which is the probation will require that you be in treatment, all right? Do you think after a year, you finally understand Aaron was not your husband? A year of those experiences, never seeing him. No, I think everyone is crazy and I'm right. Okay, what about five years? Do you have children together? No, but fur babies. Okay, <laughs> fur babies. So you don't get to see your fur babies either. Uh, and you don't see you don't see Aaron for five years. Every time you try, and you haven't been able to go back to work, Jennifer won't let you come back because you haven't been in treatment, and uh, and she's concerned about the, uh, you know, the appearance of having an employee who's stalking somebody, just like Margaret Mary Ray stalked David Letterman. There you are, stalking Aaron. Do you think after five years, you finally understand you had a mental illness, this was a, this was a delusion? Oh, it would just be all very confusing and very distressing to me. Okay. So you would, you would still believe you're married to Aaron, right? Yes. That's what it's like to have anastignosia for mental illness. The belief is unshakable. The belief that you're not sick, there's nothing wrong with you, is unshakable. Um, and let me thank you, actually. Let me, let me stop there. Uh, I'm going to talk in a moment about feelings. So let me just ask you real quickly. Did you have any feelings, any emotions as we were doing this, as you imagine this really happening to you? I felt shame. I felt distress, confusion, uh, okay. scared. So scared, shame, distress, confusion. Uh, I bet if we were in person and I did some hand, you know, raise your hand if you'd like to talk about uh, Sarah's experience and, and what you felt as you imagined being in Sarah's shoes, we'd be hearing about those same emotions and some others. Thank you very much for volunteering. And when this is over, uh, I hope you'll give your husband a call. And uh, when you get home, give him a big hug. Because uh, he did not call the police on you. No, he better not. <laughs> Thank you very much for helping me out. So when helping someone with anosognosia for mental illness, the therapist, mental health worker, nurse, doctor knows best approach doesn't work because there's no collaborate. What are Sarah and I collaborating on? Not much. Maybe staying out of jail, maybe getting her job back, but she doesn't want treatment because she's not ill. 
Um, we can't expect her to be grateful or receptive or adhere to treatment. We can expect a lot of negative feelings, and some of them Sarah described, frustration, anger, hostility, fear, and then loneliness. These are some of the loneliest people I've ever met because they have a conflict with family and friends, uh, depression and isolation, and not engaging in treatment. So the LEAP approach, as I said, is based in part on motivational interviewing, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. It actually grew out of a therapy Aaron T. Beck and I uh, were studying a short-term seven-session inpatient uh, therapy designed to engage people in treatment. And with Dr. Beck's blessing, I, I turned this into a communication program. So it's reflectively listening without judgment and with respect. Remember what I talked about earlier, the relationship that leads to treatment. Empathizing, agreeing, finding areas where you can agree with the person. It's not going to be that you agree the person is ill. It's going to be things like getting out of the hospital, staying out of the hospital, getting a job, finding a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. My brother told me the only thing I need is a job and a wife, <laughs> love and work. I have heard that countless times. You know, big surprise, persons with serious mental illness are people and they want what we all want. Um, we partner on those areas where we agree. Now there's a, what looks to be an unfortunate acronym, DOA, but in fact, if you don't use these tools, I often think our, our relationships are dead on arrival. So among the other tools are delaying giving hurtful, contrary opinions, giving our opinions with the three A's. What are those? Apologize, acknowledge your fallibility, and ask the person to agree to not argue, agree to disagree. So what would that look like? Let's say Sarah asked me, do you think I'm married to Aaron? I would say, Sarah, I'm sorry. It's the first day. I could be wrong. I don't know everything. That's a second A. I hope we don't have to argue about this. Uh, agree to disagree. So those are the three A's. You can do, use one, two, or all three of them. I'm sorry. I could be wrong, and I hope we don't have to argue about this. I don't see that you are married to him, but I don't want to argue if that's okay with you, if we can agree to disagree. So that's the way you give your opinion. It's very respectful. It's very humble. And we apologize for acts and interactions that felt hurtful to the person. So General guidelines, absorb what you've heard. Usually that inv involves reflective listening. Emotionally connect with the person around their perspective, their point of view, not mine, not the staff's point of view. Emotionally connect with their uh, experience by empathizing and apologizing for things that were hurtful. And then you can start to problem solve. Then you can look for areas of agreement and partner on those. Use, of these, use these tools as you need them. The seven leap tools are not steps. They're tools in a tool belt. So you may start with reflective listening, then move right to giving your opinion or delaying giving a hurtful opinion. So reflect back without judgment, express empathy for feelings, especially arising from delusions, anisognosia, what the person wants, find areas of agreement, move forward to achieve common goals, delay giving hurtful and contrary opinions. You redirect the person and get them talking. Uh, and I'm going to give you a, a resource where you can get a lot more information on what I'm just covering very quickly here. You give your opinion with humility and in a way that respects the person's truth. And we apologize for acts and interactions that felt disrespectful or, or frustrating or disappointing. So this is just like learning a language. If you are intrigued by this, I'm going to give you some resources and you want to practice. You want to role play with your coworkers. So I want to thank you for your attention. And the resources can be found in two places, leapinstitute.org and also HA Center. It stands for Henry Amador Center on Anisognosia, hacenter.org or leapinstitute.org. I suggest you go to both. There's free videos uh, uh, demonstrating LEAP in great detail uh, in a number of different scenarios, including offering treatment to somebody who has anisognosia. So again, I, you know, if you're intrigued by this, you want to learn more about how to do it, go to leapinstitute.org uh, and you will, or HA Center, and uh, you'll find uh, a lot of resources there, including these videos that I mentioned. Thank you for your attention. Special thanks to Sarah uh, for, for volunteering and, and helping me out. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, and so we appreciate you, Dr. Amador. We appreciate everyone uh who was on the call feel free if you want to tap in and put a question in the chat box before you leave we'll be glad to we're not going to answer it today but um, 
we can look into finding you some answers. Um, but thank you. Yeah, yeah please, please uh, Dr. Gibson, send send those to us. You know who to send it to, Jason. Yes. And I, I will answer any questions people uh, want to pose. So get them to Dr. Gibson and she will get them to me and I'll, I'll answer. Okay. Fantastic.